Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Again, these words from our text, If anyone is you without sin, let him be first, just throw a stone. So, where is your focus this evening? Are you a person that gets lost in the details? Let's just consider our drama for a moment. Did you focus on the location of the drama itself? Where it was taking place? I mean, there are some people that believe drama has no place in a sanctuary. Believe me, I've seen drama played out in sanctuary many times. Especially if you've ever gone to a wedding. Or a funeral. Or a visitation before a funeral. How about their participants that were here tonight and their ability to act the part? Did you consider that at all? Uh, Rick spent too much time with that tape measure getting ready for it. I had a feeling. <laughs> How about the fact that the pastor was so insensitive as to use Donnie's name? I mean, Don built the fence. Or, by the way, uh, judgmentalism gets very personal, doesn't it? Or did you focus on the fact there was more discussion about the fence builder? than the building of the fence. It happens, doesn't it? This brings us all to the point of judgment this evening. Judgmentalism is founded on faulty focus. The scribes and the Pharisees were fault-finding, and as a matter of fact, they had faulty fault-finding. Their focus was only on the woman. Remember the words, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of the adultery. Now, folks, I have to tell you, I have been to the seminary, and by the way, someone shared with me at dinner tonight that some people believe this text doesn't belong in the Bible. I say baloney. It's just as important as any other text where Jesus has compassion on people. So it's there, and it's there for us for a reason. But notice, they said nothing about the man. And many commentators believe that they actually set this up. They found a prostitute, had a man go in with the prostitute, and then capture them. But where is the man? In the Old Testament, when God spoke about adultery through Moses and what was to happen, both people were to be stoned to death, not just one. It was rigged on purpose to trap Jesus. Matter of fact, verse 6 says they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis of accusing him. The trap would spring one way or the other. Either he was too lenient or he was too rigid. If he said the woman should not be stoned, he'd be accused of not following the Mosaic law. If he said not to stone the woman, uh, or if they said to stone the woman, they would report him to the Romans who wouldn't allow that kind of execution. Remember when they wanted to crucify Jesus? Who was going to do it? Them or the Romans? They weren't allowed to. So if he said to stone the woman, they'd report him to the Romans. At times, don't we have to admit we are like the scribes and the Pharisees? Especially when we become experts when we don't know the details. Again, I, I'm not going to get too personal, but a little, with uh, churches as organizations. Tonight at dinner, the people I was sitting next to, we all agree there's no perfect congregation. No perfect pastor. But a lot of us want both. We want a perfect pastor. I was told once that when I went to a church that I should have the average home that everybody else had. Try living in West County. It's not that easy. I was told that I should have an average car. Don't get one that looks too expensive and don't get one that's a clunker. We want our pastors to look nice and have nice things, but not too nice. And maybe you've even thought these thoughts before, but maybe the pastor's sermon is too long, too short, not enough illustrations, not enough humor. You got the idea? I wonder how they evaluate Jesus day in and day out. Don't we also want to focus on other people's personal life? Give advice to someone because we think our advice is pretty good? 
There's the domino effect of politics. I was told you can't preach about politics from the pulpit. Well, what can you preach about then? Nothing? Don't offend anyone. Well, tonight I might offend you all. And if I do, so be it. How about the domino effect of working within the church as an organization? I've heard about the pastors who've been here before me. Uh, I haven't heard a lot about Dr. Creefall, but he's still here. So I guess we're not going to talk about him while he's still here. But you know what? There's two, two sides of that coin. There's the layman side as well. I believe the Lord has great things in store for this church. But those great things in store are going to come when we all recognize our sin and a need for the same Savior and are on the same side of the cross seeking to reach others who are a lot more like us than we'd ever imagine. We also lack knowledge about people who are not like us. I changed the sermon from what I wrote many years ago because uh, my pet peeves aren't what they were years ago. I've grown up a little bit. So here's one of those things that maybe you've thought that I thought some time ago, but I don't think it anymore. All people on welfare just don't want to work. Isn't that what people say? I've met some of those people that aren't able to work. How about all, oh, I like this one. Bear with me. All people above the age of 90 are not productive. Now, I want you to notice I changed the age because I'm getting older. <laughs> I, I used to have in here people above the age of 80, but no, I don't think I want that in there anymore. <laughs> when I was younger, the number was younger. But do you know, old people have a lot to offer. An older generation has experience. An older generation has flexible time. You get to choose how you use it. Matter of fact, we're told that volunteerism is on the way up with older people. Here's another one. Bear with me. All drivers who have white hair are not good drivers. I wear a cap when I drive. <laughs> And I do it most of the time on purpose. <laughs> now, you could add your own pet judgment to this, couldn't you? Things that drive you nuts. Are you really looking at it honestly, or are you being judgmental? I wonder, I'm going to pick on Alex again, and I'm not going to ask him to answer the question, but, you know, when someone comes to visit a church, they have an opportunity to evaluate that church from many different aspects. I said to Alex, I'd like to visit with him sometime just to talk about his observations. It can be a little scary to ask somebody for their observations, can't it? Because it might mean we might need to change just a little. Not 180 degrees, but just a little. You've heard this from me before, but I'm going to straighten it out again tonight so you don't judge me anymore. When you point your finger at someone else, Three fingers and a thumb are pointing back at you. I had to correct that because one time I did this and someone said, don't you know, Pastor, one of those is a thumb? So tell me if people can or cannot get judgmental in every aspect of their life. Be careful. God's focus is finite and it is final. Jesus speaking in the Sermon on the Plain. Do not judge. And you will not be judged. Got that? Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the speck in your own eye? Ooh, I don't like that one. But it fits, doesn't it? Even for two carpenters working on a fence. God's judgment is focused on sin. Let's go back to what Jesus says. If any one of you is without sin, forgiveness is focused on God's grace. First of all, to the woman. After they left, he says, where's your accusers? Well, they're gone. Well, then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. 
He didn't encourage her to continue to sin, but he didn't condemn her either. How about to us? God's grace and mercy to us through Christ. Hebrews chapter 12. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. The word tonight start out with focus. And we continue with focusing on Christ's huge part before Good Friday. His ministry lasted about three and a half years. Public ministry. But he knew his future was in Jerusalem. And he knew he had to go there to die for the sins of all people. Look at what he did before Good Friday. He was good before Good Friday. He healed diseases. Had compassion on those who we would not want to deal with. As someone said the other day, would you deal with Zacchaeus or Matthew? No way! Not as a person that's a Jew. Jesus did. How about, what was his focus on Good Friday? Well, look what he did. In the midst of his suffering, he has compassion on his mother. He has compassion by giving her John to take care of her. He has compassion on the thief on the cross. He had compassion on those who crucified him. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he had compassion on you. Because he died for your sins as well. How about his focus on the day of his ascension? He didn't say, I'm out of here. You're on your own. I'm going back to my father. No. He gave the disciples the great commission. And that was the commission that has brought us to faith. And is our motivation to continue to reach out to those who need him as much as we need him. How about today? Would you believe he's still focused on you? We believe that he sits at the right hand of God and he intercedes on our behalf. The other day when I was praying, one of the members here and I were talking about prayer and it was a great discussion, but after I got in talking on the phone with him, I started to pray, and I couldn't, I just couldn't help but think about this. Before I say the word, he knows it. Isn't that scary? But isn't that God's grace? Even our feeble prayers at times, those are the ones that we think about before we say, and he's already thought it. What a blessing that he already has got his grace going ahead of us. Then Jesus said to his disciples, when you ask anything in my name, believing in him, trusting in him, he indeed will lead us away from judgmentalism to compassionate forgiveness and forgetting. One commentator in the Life Application Bible that I was reading said this, notice that the older men left first and then the younger. That might also be a lesson for us. He says, whatever your age, take an honest look at your life. Recognize your sinful nature and look for ways to help others rather than hurt them. One of the favorite books I've read many years ago, and I encourage you to find it if you can and read it. It's a Christian novel written by Randy Elkhorn. It's entitled The Wisdom Hunter. It's based based on the life of a pastor of a big church who thinks he's got everything right. And his daughter runs away with someone else without getting married. And he doesn't handle it real well. And the book is all about the wisdom God gives him through all the experiences you would never think would happen to him. That's why I think 90-year-olds still have something to offer. How many mistakes have you made in your life? And how have you learned from them? And how can you help others? How can we befriend Alex? You know, he's a, I think he's an okay guy. Uh, he did shave, I think, since the last time I saw him. <laughs> and, and that's okay, too. The point is, how are we going to relate with people because of what we've been through? 
I'm sure Dr. Kriefel could tell us sometimes the person that helps the most is the person who's experienced something closely associated with what you've experienced. Because you can come alongside that person and you can help them. Two last pieces of advice about dealing with judgmentalism. Think twice before speaking once. Better yet, in difficult situations, pray twice before speaking at all. Ask the Lord to help you. Help us, O oh Lord, to go away from judgmentalism to being compassionate and forgiving. As you take the stone of judgment home with you tonight, as these stones keep piling up, take a look at each one of them and say, which one am I struggling with today? And then pray and ask the Lord to lead you to confess your sin and rejoice in the comfort that he offers. Amen? Amen. Our sermon response is the hymn, When Peace Like a River. <laughs>